let's go and do it. Very good. So today we need to talk about managing product services brands. And if I can then get to services marketing in particular, we'll be caught up. If not, it's not a big deal. I can get caught up in another day. Uh, we've got one more day uh, before we start doing group presentations. And I don't think group presentations should take all three days. So hopefully I'll be able to get totally up caught up. But if I can get through services today, we will uh, be totally caught up, even after all the snow days and all of that that have occurred. So brands are important. Managing them successfully is important. Products have life cycles. One of the things that we find, because marketing is a fairly new academic discipline, we borrow a lot in terms of analogy, particularly from other disciplines. And so what has a life cycle? Well, obviously, humans have a life cycle, right? We're born, we, uh, we get older, and then eventually we return to the dirt, right? So uh, there's a great set of stained glass windows that depict this in the Scottish Rite Temple in Guthrie, Oklahoma, where I'm from. If you've never been to the temple, it's worth seeing. It's $5. It's open twice a day at 10 and 2. You can tour it. They've got 13 rooms dedicated after ancient civilizations, and there are three of the world's most um, renowned stained glass windows in the Blue Lodge room of the temple in Guthrie. And they depict man in, in the early era, and he's in this um, garden, and there's still sort of uh, frost on the, the, um, the leaves of the garden, and there isn't a lot of things are budding out, there aren't a lot of trees, and he's very young and he's playing with a liar. And the second that he's on the first step of a uh, sort of gazebo thing. And then in the second, he's on the second step, the trees are in full bloom, the sun is high, uh, and he's in, in middle age. And then the third, he's on the third step and walking with the cane. And it's winter and he's, he's an old man. So products go through the same thing. And depending on the type of product it is, depends on whether or not that life cycle is something like this. So if we look at a life cycle, it can go something like that, a fad, for example, or something that is longer, where you have a longer life cycle. So what's an example of a fad? Something that will come in, catch on really quickly, and and exit equally as quickly. You all are to what? A trend. A trend, a specific example. What's something that would be a specific example that you would think of that's been a fad? Popular song. Popular song. A popular song. How long does something stay on the billboard charts? Months, maybe. Maybe weeks. There are artists that come and go just as quickly. One hit wonders. Their life cycle is, in terms of being an artist is, is enormously short. Can you all think of any one hit wonders? Uh huh. Yeah. That guy, I mean, he had this one, and they had this crazy dance that went with it in video. And has he come back with anything else? No, and, and okay, I don't know who that is. That'll, that'll show my age. Okay, anybody else? I mean, those are people, and then there are artists that have lasted a long time. They're really good at managing their brand. For my generation, Madonna. I mean, we haven't heard a lot from Madonna in, in a long time, but she lasted, um, you know, well over 10 years, uh, almost 20 years in terms of being a major star. Um, from my mother's generation, there's an artist, and she's the only artist, you all have probably never heard of her, who had a top 10 single in her teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. That's Cher. And she's the only one. She's the only one who's had one in her teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. So she, her life cycle has obviously been enormously long in terms of being able to stay out there. One of the things that I remember that had a life cycle that looked like this and bad were when I was uh, in high school, these little stupid dolls called Beanie Babies came out. And, any of you heard, and, and they were trading at one point in time for 
Like literally, if you had rare Beanie Babies for thousands of dollars, and I think actually, I, I made this comment last semester and somebody looked up, because I have the Princess Diana Beanie Baby, because I was sure that was gonna be a collector's item, and somebody looked it up and that Beanie Baby is still trading for several thousand dollars if you have the Princess Diana Beanie Baby. But the other Beanie Babies, for the most part, they're not trading you know, for, for hundreds or thousands, of, you know, they're stupid little dolls. So, uh, products have a life cycle. Coca-Cola has had an enormously long life cycle. I've asked you where, where you think Coca-Cola is in the life cycle before in this class, I think. And some of you have said you think it's in the maturity. Oh, thank you. Yeah, some of you don't even know from last time. I forgot about that. Good thing that one of you reminded me. Now I'm starting to look around. <laughs> so, um, Coca-Cola's had this enormously long life cycle. I think it's probably in the decline, at least in the United States, because people are realizing that water is not enormously, or uh, sugar and water, sugar water is not very good for you. So in the introduction, generally your sales grow slowly, and you have minimal profit, if you have any profit at all. Lots of companies never achieve profitability, and they go broke. It's one of the things when all of the social media sites launched, for example, Facebook. They never understood how it was going to be profitable. It has, but a lot of the social media sites didn't. MySpace and, and some others have come and gone. You have to advertise heavily to stimulate primary demand. Then when you get to the growth, so this is sort of the introductory, and then when you get to the growth stage in here, you get increase in sales and competitors appear. So MySpace wasn't the first social media site out there, was it? I don't even think Facebook or, or not. I don't even think MySpace was the first, but MySpace was one of the big ones that came in, and that attracted other people like Facebook. Now, what else is in the market in terms of social media? Um, Instagram. What else? Twitter is a social media site. YouTube. What we're doing here is basically a social media site, allowing you to broadcast yourself. Um, some of these have not lasted very long. Vine. People became millionaires on Vine. They became instant uh, success stars. People um, like the Paul uh, brothers um, came out, and Vine's gone, right? Uh, MySpace, for all, I think you can still log on to MySpace, but it's, it's pretty well a, a dead platform in terms of, of being there. It was sort of a fad. So competitors enter, and then your profits begin to peak. In the maturity, the industry as a whole starts to see a decline. So if we think about computers, again, this is one that had a long life cycle. I remember my mother's first computer that she bought for her real estate office. It was in the 1980s, 1984. At that point in time, it cost uh, like $1,000 for this computer. I was born in 1973, just to give you some idea of how much a thousand dollars was at that point in time. In the year that I was born in 1973, the average household income in the United States was $17,000. A new car was on average was $3,000. You could buy a pound of coffee for 55 cents. Right? I mean, so um, that was a lot of money. So, I mean, we don't think about $1,000 being a lot because the iPhone 10R or whatever, you can now get a 10 for less than 1000 But what's a 10R? So, if anyone can look at this, what does it cost? You bought it outright. $1,000. Right? So, it doesn't seem like that would be a lot to pay for a computer, but at the time, that was an enormous amount of money. So, she paid $1,000 for this computer. What are, what are computers? Well, they've changed, right? The desktop computer was big. It had these. It didn't even have an internal hard drive. It ran off of these things called floppy disks, which is actually we still use the icon for those as the save button. You know, if any of you remember, these are if you've seen them. If your parents had them, these huge, big. They started out by three by five floppies, and then they got a hard case because they were easy to damage. So the product life cycle has been enormously long for computers. Marginal competitors leave the market. 
So what's happened in terms of computers? Well, lots of people that came out with computers are gone. They're, they've left the market. They're no longer there. You've got Dell and, and a few big ones. Um, profits declined due to competition. And then in the final or the death stages, things like a fax machine. Fax machines would be in the death rows. Almost nobody faxes anything anymore. There are some, uh, when HIPAA first came out, there were some people, the doctor's offices particularly, that were going back to faxes for a brief period there because they thought that was more HIPAA compliant. But it's basically dying. Have you seen a fax machine in, in an office recently? People still list their fax number, but I don't know anybody who's actually received a fax in decades because we now have what? Email, which sends things uh, a lot faster. So companies delete or harvest the products at that point. So again, there's no set time. You can have something that looks like this or something that goes over a long period of time. Some products will, yes. Um, I was reading on this and one that showed that there's a stage called the rebirth. Like, for example, like vinyl, vinyl, and yeah. now they're coming back. Yeah, so vinyl was almost practically good, <coughs> and nobody was making vinyl records. And then all of a sudden, your generation decided that it was sort of to go back to these ideas that, you know, where there's like this nostalgia factor. Yeah. And so vinyl was coming back. Actually, vinyl had great sound if it wasn't scratched. It was very, del it was pretty delicate. It does, and it looks expensive. And people used to collect records, and it was a big deal. People had they'd spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on their their record collection, and so it was really uh, it was something that was um, really really important to them. And in fact, a lot of older music you can still get on vinyl, and those collections may be worth something uh, if you have them. My father actually had a whole collection of. Sort of the rap packs music on vinyl, and he do donated them to a university. They wanted them, and he got thousands of dollars in tax deductions for his, his vinyl record collection. But yeah, you can have a rebirth of things. I don't think that Beanie Babies are going to have a rebirth, this, but maybe uh, there are some fashions a lot of times will come back in style. So, for example, uh, bell bottoms in the 1960s. I do not understand. This. I mean, there these people were in the middle of a sexual revolution wearing clothing that was just god awful ugly and unattractive. But they sort of made the comeback in like the 90s, the wide leg jeans and stuff like that. And came back. Not bell bottoms per se, but that sort of same style. And you see a lot of the same sort of colors and patterns being used today in clothing from the 1960s. And I just kind of sit there and think. Yeah, it was really ugly in the 1960s, and it's still ugly today. <laughs> Shag carpeting has, for, in some instances, has made a comeback, or at least longer nap, not real shag, but this longer nap carpeting. I've seen people put it in their house, and I'm just like, oh, it's creepy, it's gross. And carpeting itself is just sort of disgusting. It's yeah. just a breeding ground for bacteria. But um, yes, you can have a rework of things like that, vinyl, vinyl records, yeah, come back. Um, so I use the example Coca-Cola has a very long life cycle. Coca-Cola will be around for a long time. It's in the United States, I think it's in the decline, but it's still, people drink Coke. I mean, I've, I've given up drinking soda pop, uh, but a lot of people still drink it. And in the developing world, it's, it's become you know, more popular and it's, it's not its life cycle there, maybe different than it is in the United States. So high learning products, um, things like the computer, things that took a long time to learn, generally have longer life cycles versus low learning products, which are things like you know, clothing items that we don't necessarily have to, to learn a lot about. So product level, in terms of class and form. So there can be categories in the class. So what's category, for example, in computing and form. Well, there's desktop computers, right, which are on their way maybe out or in the declining stage of the life cycle. What's not on the, the decline, though, maybe? 
Well, it's maybe in the maturity stage of the product life cycle in terms of computing. Um, laptops. Right? People are using laptops. I mean, there, there's a certain point. You could say these smart devices, particularly in places that are not in the developed world, like the United States and Great Britain or places like that, you could say that maybe this has reached the maturity stage for this, but people are recognizing, you know, there was this idea that everybody would do everything on their phone. Well, if you're really going to work, I mean, seriously work, you have to have something bigger than your phone. Uh, and you have to have a keyboard to really put out long documents or anything like that that you need. For example, as a lawyer, I couldn't type an entire contract on, my, I, mean, I guess I could, but it would be really inefficient and slow. And so laptop computing is still necessary. But what's happened with regard to laptops, I remember my first laptop, I got it in 1993 when I went to college. My, my parents paid for a laptop. It was heavy, it was big, the screen wasn't in color, and it was not, it was the screen was kind of small compared to the size of the laptop itself and how heavy it was. I think it weighed something like 10 pounds. My laptop back there that I'm using to uh, you know, go live and stream onto YouTube, how much does that weigh? You guess. How much does, huh? Two pounds. Maybe two pounds. I mean, they're enormously light. They're a lot smaller. And the screen, actually, my first one was a lot bigger than that and had a much smaller screen. That was one of those green, green screens. It was uh, green and black. And that one's got a full color screen, right? So there's um, a lot of variation. So life cycle and consumers will be dependent on sales. Obviously, consumers ultimately decide whether products live or die or how long they live. So branding of our products. Brand scholars will argue, like Kevin Lane Keller, that branding is the most important decision a company will make. Brand scholars argue that branding is the most important decision that a company will make. Now this is an example of what I call academic arrogance because academics have a tendency to say that you can explain the entire world from the perspective of their discipline so for example and I, I've noticed this in myself I started out not as a marketer I started out as a political scientist and a lawyer and so I would have said at that time when I used to teach American national government it was fascinating to me that students would come into my class and they would say I just don't like government Politics is boring. Really? Really? Politics is boring. I argued that politics made the world go round. Everything is political. If you don't think so, think about what the definition of politics is. Some political scientists define politics as who gets what, when, where, and how. Well, your friendships are political, aren't they? You decide which of your friends is going to have either the honor or perhaps the terror of your company. And when, don't you? And maybe in your posse, there is a group leader who actually decides where we're going to go, what we're going to do. Who's going to go with us? Who's going to be part of the cool kids club? That's politics. If you think politics doesn't happen in your, how you get your job is largely political. Every job I've ever gotten, I didn't get because of what I knew. It was because of who I knew. Do you know how I became associate general counsel here at UCO? My best friend was general counsel. Nobody would have hired a kid right out of law school to be the associate general counsel at the third largest institution in Oklahoma in their right mind, but for the fact that my best friend was general, you know how he got his job? 
He had worked for George Nye when George Nye was governor. He worked on his campaign and he worked in the governor's office. And when George Nye became president of the university, he remembered him and gave him a job. It's not what you know, it's who you know that's gonna get you the job in many instances. What you know will keep you in the job. Because if you don't know anything, you're gonna get fired. But it's who you know, that's politics. And so as a political scientist, I used to argue that this is what made the world go round. So Keller, who's a brand scholar, you know, argues the same thing. Branding makes the world go round. Everything is branded. Think about it. Everything that you wear, your watch has a brand, your jacket has a brand, your shirt has a brand, your shoes are branded. Why in the hell does Nike put brands on the bottom of the shoes? Because they own the souls too. Yeah, I, I mean... When it leaves a, a mark on the in the dirt, it says Nike. It's branding. <laughs> you're, it, you're, it's pervasive, so you can understand. So, But I will tell you that I think this is an overstatement, and I'll tell you why. Because I, as an attorney, took a lot of companies through bankruptcy that had great brands. They had fantastic, they had come up with a very good design, they had a great logo, great branding, and they had crappy products, and they died. And they just died. Even companies that launch extension, brand extensions, Windows Vista, no, it was horrible. That's a, that's a cool sounding name, great brand, horrible product, and it died. And so, you know, it's important, but it may not be the most important. I think having a good product may be more important than branding. So brand management has been a major topic of research and marketing um, for a long time. However, most of the field is focused on tangible goods and large corporations in terms of branding. And some of this, by the way, is not in the textbook, and it is on the next exam, so you might want to take notes of this. So what is a brand? A brand is a name, a term, a symbol, or a design that identifies the goods of a seller. So a brand is something that identifies the goods of a seller. Prince changed his name to something that I have no idea what the hell it was. It was a symbol, and nobody could pronounce it. Did anybody know what it, they just called him the artist formerly known as Prince? until he decided that he'd stop being Squiggle, or whatever the hell that was, and go back to being Prince. That symbol became his brand. Kind of a horrible symbol and branding idea, because you know, nobody knew what the hell it was. Although maybe that was brilliance, right? Brands provide a mental connection in the mind of the consumer. So if I say certain names that are familiar to you, images pop into your mind. If I say Coca-Cola, what comes to mind? Red. 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 Because their logo is largely red and white. What else comes to mind? The polar bear, they got that. They, they got that image down. The bottle. The bottle. That actually, I used to do an experiment in here. I would bring in a Coca-Cola bottle in a, in, a, in, a, in a bag. I would have somebody come up, get blind, be blindfolded. I would hand them the bottle and ask them what it was, and, and they could instantly identify. Because Coca-Cola, that is actually a, a trade dress. It is actually registered trade dress. Nobody else can use that shape of a bottle. And people always got it. They always knew that it was Coca-Cola. If I say... McDonald's, what comes to mind? What? The Golden Arches. What else? What? McDonald's. Ronald McDonald? Yeah. He actually has not been a part of their branding for a long time, but that still comes to mind. The most delicious fries in the world. Salt is good. You just can't get enough salt in your diet. 
good for you. Huh? That's why you run. <laughs> It'll be fun. If I say Long John Silver's, what fish. comes to mind? Fish. Right? Yeah. Cheap fish. <laughs> Greasy, cheap fish. And so, you know, these they provide this instant connection in the mind of the consumer. It distinguishes your product or service from another provider. And positive brand images can lead to overall company performance. So it's estimated, it's gone back and forth, but at one time Coca-Cola, and for a long time, Coca-Cola has been the most valuable brand in the world. They then said it was Microsoft or something like that. Um, but I think it's back to, they, they estimate the brand value of Coca-Cola is now either one or two. Again, so it's been an enormously important asset to the company. All because of Warren Buffett. <clears throat> All because of Warren Buffett? You think Coca Cola? Well, <clears throat> I mean, he has like 400 million shares and something like that in it. Yeah. He has the biggest company. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I think Coca Cola has done just a great job. You know, they're a far superior product to Pepsi, which is horrible and god awful. Communist crap. Um, so Brady can assist in the decision-making process. It provides, what does this mean that it assists in the decision-making process? It provides a heuristic, a shortcut, so that you know what you're getting. You don't have to think about it each time. When you see McDonald's, you know what you're going to get. Fast, cheap, consistent. That's what you know you're going to get. It may not be great, it's consistently mediocre, except for the French fries, but you know what you're going to get. It provides this heuristic. Whereas if you see something like Ma's Country Kitchen, you have no idea what the hell you're going to get. Unless you're from, you know, wherever Ma's Country Kitchen is, is located, you have no idea. Now, it sounds like it's going to be good. I mean, what is this? What is this? What is their image trying to portray? I don't know if there's a mall. I'm sure there's a mall's country kitchen somewhere, right, in the country. I'm just making this up. But what does that sort of, what does that conjure up to you? What does that brand conjure up to you? What home kinds of food do you think they would serve? Home cooking? Yeah, home cooking, lies and chicken. Steak. Chicken, steak. steak. Probably not going to get coconut, right? <laughs> or Chateau Or Chateaubriand. Right? You're probably not going to get any of those things at Ma's Country Kitchen. <laughs> it's, it's probably going to be grease laden. But because you don't know that brand that well and you're not familiar, maybe it does. Maybe Ma's Country Kitchen. Maybe it's Ma's French Country Kitchen. And they're making Coco Vin because Coco Vin is, is typical in France. Yeah. Maybe Ma is, is from Paris. But probably not. But you don't know. With McDonald's, you know, don't you? When you drink a Coke, you know what you're going to get. It's a carbonated, caramelized, sugary beverage. Right? So in developing a brand, Turley and Moore suggest that there are important elements to the brand. It should be short. So think of famous brands. Dell, really short. Dell computer, four letters. Coke, KFC. They've stopped calling it Kentucky Fried Chicken. They've, they've shortened it to KFC because it's short. It's easy to remember. Rolls off the tongue easily. It should be easy to spell. Coke is easy to spell. Dell is easy to spell. Apple. Short. Easy to spell. Easy to remember. It should be distinctive. What makes Apple distinctive? What makes their brand logo distinctive? The bite out of the apple. And the fact that apples have nothing to do with computers. It's not, a, I mean, if you said, you know, processor, 
it wouldn't, you know, I mean, there's something distinctive about it that, that makes it um, easily recognizable in the world of products. What makes Dell's branding distinctive? It's the stylized way that they spell Michael Dell's last name on the Dell computer. That's distinctive. And it should not carry any negative associations. Now, this one is really, really difficult because something that is not negative today may carry negative connotations in the future. And I'll give you an example of that. And particularly in Oklahoma, we have lots of sports teams at the high school, junior high, and collegiate level that were named things like the Chiefs. My law school, Oklahoma City, before I went to law school there, they were the Oklahoma City Chiefs. And what was their icon? Well, it was sort of a Native American dressed in what we would think of as being very stereotypical headdress. It was the, the feathered headdress was their icon for the Oklahoma City Chiefs. That became not such a good thing, right? People became more sensitive, and as a result, things like the Redskins have actually lost their trademark. And, and Native American populations have called on them to change their brand image. And they haven't done it. Because they said people, you know, associate what we're not. So Oklahoma City University became the stars. But lots of teams used to have that. They stopped using that. The Redskins is one of the few. Now, I would question, what is the difference between Oklahoma City using the Chiefs and Florida State, which is the what? What's the Florida State? Seminoles. The Seminoles. <laughs> Why do they get to do that? And it's not considered politically incorrect. Isn't that where the, where the tribe lived? The were... Seminole tribe, there's two Seminole tribes, right? There's, there's, there was one Seminole tribe. They tried to remove them from Florida, and those that stayed, that retreated to the swamps, the Everglades of Florida, became the Florida Seminoles. They actually own Hard Rock, by the way. They're one of the most wealthy tribes. Not as wealthy as Chickasaw Nation. But they're fairly wealthy. The second Seminole tribe are one of the five civilized tribes, so-called five civilized tribes here in Oklahoma. So we have the Oklahoma Seminoles, which were actually led by a state senator named Kelly Haney for a long period of time. So we have two Seminole tribes, the Seminole tribe of Florida. They're from there, and they have allowed Florida State to use that as their mascot. They have given their blessing, so I guess it's okay. that they And they their mascot is a, and the guy that comes out of the field is sort of a traditionally dressed Seminole uh, warrior. But in, in, other, in others, you know, in the 1950s and 60s, when these teams were developing their names, nobody was that culturally sensitive. And so for a vast majority of people, it didn't have a negative stereotype. What are some others that, have, that at the time didn't have a negative stereotype? Well, you can go, they're still around. There's, they've changed the image. Um, there's a famous pancake and waffle brand called Aunt Jemima. And it was based off of the mammy stereotype from the South, from the deep South. And so if you go back and you look at old Aunt Jemima uh, cake mix and stuff like that, it's got this, uh, it's got this very stereotypical African-American, uh, you know, mammy, like Gone with the Wind on it. Today, she's a much more updated, modern version uh, of it. And so Uncle Ben's was another one that started out. They haven't changed the name, but they have certainly changed the, the brand image of it, or attempted to change the brand image of it, to, to deal with the negative connotations. So things that don't necessarily, so it's very difficult to predict what, what may become a, a negative association. So Turley and Moore developed a typology of brands with five basic tags. They say those descriptive brands. Now, from a trademark perspective, you don't want to be descriptive because you can lose your trademark status. Where you want to be when you file for trademark. So branding is one of the few intellectual property rights that's protected by the federal government. Most property rights are protected by state governments. The states give you your property rights. So, for example, when you buy a piece of property, you register it in the county in which you buy it. Your ownership is registered in the county. So if you buy land, you register it with the county clerk 
in the county that you live in. So, for example, most of you probably live in Oklahoma County. When you buy a home, the deed will be filed in the county. Not so with intellectual property. It's one of, it's one of the few things that the federal government actually protects in terms of property rights. Three major types of property, intellectual property protected by the federal government. Trademark, copyright, and patent. Trademark and patent are registered with the USPTO. And this is something that I used to do as an attorney. I used to practice trademark law. And I used to file trademarks frequently with the USPTO. If you file something that's basically descriptive, you may lose your trademark. You want to be on the principal register to get the highest level of protection. If a brand is really descriptive and it becomes what's called generic for a category of goods, you can lose the trademark. This happened with a company called the Murphy Bed. The Murphy Bed company manufactured beds that fold up into the wall. This is not popular in places like Oklahoma, but the Murphy Bed was very popular in places like New York City because lots of people live in what are called studios in New York City because land is so scarce that they build up and space is not widely available. And so um, you oftentimes find people living in very small spaces and in order to maximize that space, they may use their bedroom as their living room if you live in a studio apartment. So they made these beds that folded up. Murphy bed became synonymous for a bed that folded up into the wall and they lost their trademark over it. So you don't want to be just totally descriptive. There are person-based brands. What is that? Dell. Dell Computer is a person-based brand. It's based off of who? It's named after the founder, Michael Dell. Coca-Cola actually started out as a descriptive brand and it's still somewhat descriptive. Cola. Cola is defined as a carbonated, caramelized, caffeinated beverage, right? That's what a cola is. So it's still descriptive. Why is it not totally descriptive? Why was it completely descriptive when it started out? What was in, what was the secret ingredient in Coca-Cola? Cocaine. 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 Yeah. There's a big billboard in Guthrie that's painted on the side of the building, a historic uh, billboard for Coca-Cola. And actually at that time their logo was in green and it says, Coca-Cola, the relaxing beverage. Why did it relax? Well, it, was, it had cocaine in it. That was before cocaine was illegal. <laughs> associative brands. What are associative brands? Things like American Automobile Manufacturers Association. That's an associative brand. It's a company or it's a non-for-profit that lobbies on the bat on the behalf of automobile manufacturers in the United States. AAA is an associated brand. Okay. What else is an associated brand? HLAs, homeowners okay. association. associations, maybe, and be associated brands. Things that collect things together. You can have geographic reference brands. Some of these can overlap. You can have more than one. So for example, to be technically correct, and in the European Union, you cannot call something champagne. We call champagne anything that's sparkling wine, right? That pops. They talk about California champagne. In Europe, where they have strict trademark protection over this, associative brands, Champagne is an associative brand. It has to come, in order to be labeled champagne, it has to come not just from France, but from the Champagne region of France. Not just France, it's got to come from the Champagne region. So it's not only an associative, it's also a geographic reference brand. Lots of banks have geographic reference brands. Things like First National Bank of Guthrie. This is an example of how it combines with alphanumeric. So a lot of brands use, you know, letters and numbers in their brand. A1 plumbing. What's the idea there? They're the best because they're one first. And A is what we generally grade things in terms of being superior. Right? So you can get these that are that are combinations to that. One of the questions usually on the exam is something that I add. What is what is the one thing that I add to this? There's theme-based branding. 
That's another typology that I add to the, to the mix. So in addition to Charlie and Moore's, I say that there's an additional category that's theme-based. What's an example of theme-based branding? Frontier City is a theme-based brand. Why is it theme-based? What's the idea of Frontier City? It's an amusement park. It's an amusement park, but what's it based on? What's their theme? It's a land run, yeah. Frontier City. It's based on the Wild West and the land run. We're on the frontier here, and Oklahoma was the frontier at one point, and we were settled. We were settled in the land run on April 22nd, 1889, in one day. So once developed, your company needs to manage their brand. And Keller identifies 10 attributes of brand management that are necessary for you to continue to manage your brand. One, the brand develops, delivers benefits that customers truly desire. So again, you can have a great brand if you're not delivering benefits that customers want, you're probably going to go broke. <clears throat> what are examples of things that customers truly desire? Good prices. Good prices. That's Walmart, everyday low prices. Quality. Service, right? Things like that that sets you apart. The brand needs to stay relevant. Coca-Cola is an old brand, but it stayed relevant. How have they stayed relevant? By continually advertising and coming up with creative ways to reach new generations and remind them of, of why it is they should drink Coke as opposed to Pepsi. Now, Pepsi is attempting to, you know, say they're not just okay with that horrific commercial that they got with Steve Carroll. It's just a god-awful commercial. How many of you have seen this commercial? It just drives me crazy. See if I can find it. Talking about negative connotation. <coughs> I'll take a coke. Is Pepsi okay? Is Pepsi okay? Is Pepsi okay? Ow! Are puppies okay? Is a shooting star okay? Is the laughter of a small child okay? Pepsi's more than okay. It's okay. Okay, what have we learned today? You want a Pepsi? I want a Pepsi. There you go. Okay. I've got to come up with my own catchphrase. Okay. Oh. That just drives me crazy. And by the way, Pepsi is not okay. It is it is just all, all kinds of wrong. Tool of the devil. No. Coca-Cola is all American. It is red blooded. All of it is good. You know. If the baby Jesus were around, he would be a Coca-Cola. <laughs> The pricing strategy is based on customers' perception of value. So pricing is important. People have to be willing to pay the price. Why is Rolex able to charge their starting watch starts this year at $5,000? Why are they able to charge that? Because people view it as something of value. And their pricing strategy is based on that perception. You have to position your product properly. And then finally, you must be consistent. Consistency is really important. You see this in political candidates. One of the most effective ads that was ever run against a candidate was run by George W. Bush against John Kerry. And it positioned him as being a flip-flopper, whereas Bush was positioned as being consistent, and he won. Because he said, you know, he was consistently wrong, 
but he won because he positioned Kerry as being a flip-flopper. I'm George W. Bush, and I approve this message. In which direction would John Kerry lead? Kerry voted for the Iraq War, opposed it, supported it, and now opposes it again. He bragged about voting for the $87 billion to support our troops before he voted against it. He voted for education reform and now opposes it. He claims he's against increasing Medicare premiums, but voted five times to do so. John Kerry, whichever way the wind blows. <laughs> So that's an example of using inconsistency against your opponent, and it's effective. And Bush was remarkably consistent. He was one of the most disciplined politicians I've ever seen in my entire life. And that may be the downfall of Donald Trump, by the way, is he's not at all consistent. And there's no consistency there. George W. Bush was one of the most disciplined politicians I've ever seen. He had real skills. That's not necessarily something to be uh, you know, despised. He, he was definitely a very smooth political operator. So consistency is important. Your brand portfolio and hierarchy make sense. What does that mean? Well, I'll give you an example. I teach ethics, we want to get past the commercials here. The lesson's too long. We're not here. Business traveler. I have crossed the Atlantic and am now outside Washington, D.C. 55 years ago, right here, would have been the lobby of the very first Marriott Hotel. What started right here, now a chain of more than 3,000 hotels worldwide. And right at the top of Marriott, today, it's all changed. Today is Bill Marriott's 80th birthday. He's been in the hospitality business for 55 years and is now stepping down as the chief executive of Marriott. Handing over the mantle to the chief operating officer, Arnie Sorensen. I have said for years to friends, any of the person who tries to follow Bill Marriott, he's an icon of the industry. He's a enormous teacher and mentor to me as he is to so many across the industry. I met Bill Marriott at the company's headquarters where he reflected on a lifetime's work for those who've been along for the ride. What did you say when I told you I was going to become executive chairman and uh, this got too big and too complex for me? Uh, I said you created it. It's all your fault. <laughs> The Marriott story begins in 1927, when the American entrepreneur J.W. Marriott opened his root beer stand in Washington, D.C. Three decades later, he opened his first hotel. Here's my dad and mom. Right. The first hotel. He built the biggest motor hotel in the world, 
And when you opened it, it didn't do very well. I just joined the company out of the Navy. I've been in the company six months. I said, why don't you let me take a hand in writing this thing? He said, you know anything about the hotel business. I said, well, that's right. I don't, but neither does anybody else around here. So I can't do any worse than we're doing. So we got the second hotel open in Washington and the third hotel opened later. And all of a sudden I figured out we'd make more money in the hotel business than we ever would in the restaurant business. What's the one thing that has surprised you most? The fact that we could grow from one hotel to 3,700 hotels, that really shocked me. I thought, you know, it took us seven years to build five hotels. And I thought, well, maybe we'll get to 10 or 15. And at what point did you look over your shoulder and think, whoa, well, where did that all come from? <laughs> Every day. <laughs> <laughs> the rapid growth was achieved with a formula that has come to define today's hotel industry. Many brands all under one umbrella. 1981, we had a lot of big box hotels, big city hotels. Somebody said, you know, we're gonna run out of great locations where we can build these big hotels. We gotta do something to grow the company and let's go and build a hotel for the businessman. We did a million dollars worth of research. We asked our customers, what do you want in a hotel? They said a better room at a lower price. I said to our people, are you kidding me? You mean we spent a million dollars to find out people want a better room at a lower price? So we built one. We built a 150 room courtyard in downtown and in the suburbs of Atlanta. And then on it goes from the, uh, the courtyard, the Fairfield, to, and then you add in Ritz Carlton. That's right. Yeah. We have 18 different brands. Too many? No, we, we keep adding. We just added AC hotels in Europe. If we find another niche for a, a brand, we'll, we'll develop another brand. The job of creating that next brand falls on the company's new CEO, Arnie Sorensen. His task is to keep the Marriott giant moving with the times. What we see as the future of the core Marriott Full Service Hotel is a place that obviously provides a great night's sleep, it provides a comfortable room, but it also provides public space which can welcome people and which can invite them to read and have at the lobby. Customers are saying it's no longer enough for me to have a great night's sleep in a big room and in a clean room. I want my senses excited in some way. Exciting the senses in that way demands a new brand and a controversial move for Marriott. Partnering with Ian Schrager, celebrated arbiter of call, credited with inventing the boutique hotel concept, the Paramount the Mondrian, the Sanderson, the Hudson, the Gramercy Park, and now, in this unlikely partnership with Marriott, comes addition. The idea is to kind of rethink the hotel business and doing the same thing I did 25 years ago when we invented the boutique hotel. That's the point. 25 years ago, you invented the boutique hotel. It's been done. So what are you going to add to it this time? This is not a boutique hotel as such. That was a different animal that we created. But the whole idea of doing a hotel, it's supposed to manifest popular culture and who we are today in the same way people do with cars and technology and movies and theater and, 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 and music. It's the same kind of thing. It's popular culture update. Okay, so what do we now want today? We want something very unassuming and very comfortable. We're not looking for design on steroids. We're looking for good old fashioned, good taste and good style and great service at a reasonable value. Together, Schrager and Marriott hope to achieve what has so far eluded the big hotel companies, with the exception of Starwood's W, the lifestyle of boutique, without compromising the good night's sleep. What's happened in this space broadly is that the folks who are delivering this lifestyle experience are not also delivering great customer service. Even, even Ian would say the great hotels that he started in the early 80s and continued into the 90s offered a wonderful design and a wonderful nightlife, but a lousy night's sleep. The message echoes clearly from both camps. No more style over substance. Out with design on steroids. In with style and comfort. So, as I've asked you before, will you have a chair that's comfortable that I can sit in? Oh, good point. Good point. Because you know me and my chair. I'd North Wind Legger chair. North Wind Legger chairs. 
No tricks. No tricks. That I share on the cigarette. I ain't comfortable. I'm comfortable working. You could work in it. On the desk. I like it. You could read in it. And you could light it. Those are the things. I think we're not. I think that's what we're The brand launched last year with hopes to grow the concept quickly into a chain of dozens of locations. You sold out a chain. Marriott, you would have walked over hot coals rather than done a deal with a chain. I, I would have uh, walked over hot coals rather than to sell out. But what Marriott offers me was something that I couldn't really do before. So to me, it's the opposite of selling out. It's like, hey, let's come up with this great idea and let's keep it to ourselves and the family and do it. Coming up after the break, a good night's sleep with our Hollywood star, Richard Gere. It's so, with regard to this idea of the brand portfolio and hierarchy makes sense, what makes sense about this brand portfolio? So they've got Courtyard, they've got Residence Inn, they've got Addition, they've got JW Marriott, they've got, uh, what else? Fairfield is a Marriott property. What makes sense about this brand portfolio and hierarchy? It's all in the lodging industry. They're not going into QB dolls and t-shirts. It's all within the same industry. It's a vertical integration of this. So the hierarchy makes sense. This is not them going into a clothing line or cosmetic makeup. That's one of the things that I've noticed all of these people are doing. All of these actresses and stuff like that, they think that they're all coming out, you know, Joel Osteen. Tool of the devil, by the way. Horrible. Hor no theology whatsoever there. But, you know, this is my Bible. Do they all be taught the word? Really, Joel? You've never read it. It's, it's obvious you've never read it. But his wife, who's even more vapid than he is, now thinks she can do what? Sell makeup. She's coming out with a Victoria Olstein makeup line. That doesn't make any sense. That 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 brand portfolio does not make sense. Jesus and makeup. <laughs> what? Are you crazy? No. I'm sure it will be a smashing success. Probably not. The brand uses the full repertoire of marketing activities to build equity. What does that mean? That means that they have good service. They use the four P's and they use all of these marketing activities to come up with a good product, service, price, and then the full promotional suite to come up with things that will build brand equity, that will deliver. The brand managers understand what the brand means to consumers. That means that you understand what the consumers think. You understand what your position is in the market. I'm not sure that brand managers at, at McDonald's now understand what the brand means to the consumer. They are attempting to shift their brand image from being fast, cheap, and consistent to being more like Starbucks. Now, maybe they understand. Maybe they want to reposition it, but I don't think that's going to work very well. Once you have established the brand in the mind of the consumer, it's, it's really hard to change. McDonald's actually has better coffee than Starbucks, according to coffee connoisseurs now who do, who do taste tests. Starbucks still has really crappy coffee, but that's not what McDonald's is known for. And so trying to change that may mean that there's brand consumer or those brand managers don't really understand what, the, what, what it is in the mind of the consumer. And they're continuing, maybe they're sending those messages because they're continuing to promote their dollar menu with this. So maybe we understand partly what our consumers want, but I don't think that people who want to go to Starbucks for a $5 cup of coffee are looking for a dollar value. Right? They're looking for something else. The brand is given proper support. This is an example of, an example of not giving the brand proper support. GM started this company called Saturn that was supposed to be a new car company, a new way to buy a car. They never gave it 
the support it needed and it died. The brand just died. They just they just didn't support it the way it needed to be supported. And the company continues to monitor sources of brand equity. How do you do that? Well, in this day and age, what's the biggest way that you monitor sources of brand equity? You're going to have to monitor social media and make sure that what's being out there. You're going to have to monitor that and see what people are saying. That's why the brand, the brand managers are now hiring not just traditional ad companies, but they are hiring social influencers, individuals, to go out and promote their brand. So living the brand. Organizations, obviously, businesses act, although they are legal entities. Businesses, corporations are legal persons. Mitt Romney made a gaffe on the campaign trail, but what he said was actually technically legally correct. When Mitt Romney was running for president against Barack Obama, they, somebody in the crowd, some heckler, started railing about corporations. And Mitt Romney said, corporations are people, my friends! And everybody laughed. But corporations are legal people. What does that mean, that they are legal people? They can sue and be sued in their own name. They may survive their founders. They can go on into perpetuity. Ford Motor Company has, has surpassed the, life, the lifespan of multiple generations of Fords to still be in existence. It is a corporation distinct and separate from its, its directors and officers. They can own property in their own right. But obviously, they're not real people. They are legal people, but they're not real people. And they act through their agents. So organizations that live the brand instill in their employees the sense of loyalty. In order to get them to consistently promote that brand image. Who's one of the companies that does this the best, in my opinion? Southwest Airlines. Southwest employees love Southwest, and you can tell. They don't necessarily pay the best of any of the airlines, but their employees are fiercely loyal to Southwest, and they consistently live the brand. They consistently project the values, the vision, and the culture of that organization. When I was getting my PhD at New Mexico State, one of my friends, my favorite activity in the fall is to go to the Oklahoma State Fair. I just love the fair. And one of my former colleagues knew this, that I worked with at AEC. And he said, you want to come to the fair? And I said, you know, I'm really, I don't have the time or the money this year to come back to Oklahoma to go to the fair. And he said, I've got a bunch of miles. He was still working for the company that I'd worked for. He said, I've got a bunch of miles. I'll buy you a ticket so you can come back to the fair. I love the fair. So I had a first class ticket on American Airlines, which when I was an executive, I used to fly first class all the time because I had tons of miles. So I, the company wouldn't pay for first class, but I could always get bumped up using my miles to first class. And so I'm standing there in the American Airlines line, and I have lots of time to get to the airport and plenty of time <coughs> on my plane from El Paso, or El Piso as I refer to it, because I hated every minute of living there. And this employment zone, she's like, why are you in this line? You got a first class ticket. Get in that one. And I'm like, if this is how you treat your first class passengers, and then they were throwing my bag around and telling me it was too heavy. And I'm like, wow, if this is how you, you never experienced that in South. I've never seen a Southwest employee who was having a bad time. When they do the whole flight safety thing about how to, like everybody should know how to buckle their seatbelt, right? I mean, by this point, it, they make fun of it. I mean, they're, they're they have a good time at this. You never see that on America, the Delta. I mean, it's just it's just awful. It's an awful experience. 
Southwest is, is not the most expensive and they don't have the most comfortable seats and they don't provide the best food, but their employees live this brand consistently. Any questions about branding? Well, I'm probably not gonna get to services today, so that's a good place to stop. I only have 10 minutes, so I don't wanna start that and try to rush through it. So on Tuesday, we'll talk about services and maybe talk about pricing. And then on Thursday, according to the schedule, we start on the presentations, right? So on Tuesday, we'll draw for order of go on the group presentation that you've got. Um, submit your article reviews to the Dropbox, 30 by midnight tonight. That's the uh, one that has the due date on there is the one I think is attached to the grade function. So if you would, to the grade uh, column in the grade function, so if you do that, we would appreciate it. And be sure and sign, I just passed a roll sheet, didn't I? So if you came in late, be sure and sign. <laughs> Uh -huh. The same time. So on 